This is Honoré Fanon Jeffers, and I'm reading Counsel to a Bridegroom, translated by Bala Saho. Dereo, dere kumbambai, manhai sinaya kelolenya, dereo, dere kumbambai, manhai sinaya kelolenya. Kumbambai, Jatokati kana asulu wori, niba anena kana akumama, niba anena kana asuloma. O oh, dere, dere kumbambai, I am afraid of the fight between co-wives, O oh, dere, dere kumbambai, I am afraid of the fight between co-wives, kumbambai. You can harvest the bitter tomato, but do not uproot it. If you insult her, do not touch her parents. If you insult her, do not touch her roots. About this poem. Counsel to a Bridegroom is a traditional Mandinka folk poem that has been passed down through many generations going back at least 100 years. As an archivist and researcher, Dr. Bala Saho has collected poems, songs, folklore, and proverbs from the Mandinka people of the Gambia, West Africa, his ancestral homeland. Well, I want to start out by saying that Barb and I are huge fans of your music. We, we love seeing you live when we get the chance. Yeah. And we 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 appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. Oh, that's a that's a great way to start, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Dr. Marv Howard, and we're here today uh, to talk about his book, his In Search of Elfland, and I. I just saw you post it, you know, like on Facebook, and and I go, what is this? I like the cover. I like, I'm going to look at this book. Uh, you like my music? I really, really like your book, and I thought it would be fun for uh, folks who listen to the Lo-Fi Lounge and can delve into it because friends that I have uh, kind of shared with, and I say, you know, there's this book I was, I was, I was reading. They're they're big elves, Tolkien. I mean, the whole thing. You filled a real uh, important need. I've been interested in this in the Scottish folklore since I was a kid. Yeah, my mom's family, my great greats on mom's side, came from Scotland and settled in Iowa in the nineteenth century. And so I grew up with mom saying little things like, "You have to turn your shirt in backwards to, so the fairies don't see you," yeah. and just little weird. Scottish things, folklorish things. So I found myself when I was back in grad school in the 90s, I needed to do something for a master's thesis. Okay. Because I was going from computer science, which is where I started, and moving into education and instructional technology and how to use computers for learning and teaching. Right. And my master's was something that I could pick and do whatever the heck I wanted. Oh. So I jumped into English literature and I did a thesis on Scottish folklore. And so the, my book is essentially during the pandemic, I came back to looking at stuff I'd worked on. Um, and I said, I should do something with my master's thesis. It, other people might be interested in it. It's a scholarly work on this. On one hand, you could tell it comes from research. But on the other hand, there's a a joy in it and a, and a, a a, an energy 
that comes from, I guess, from you being a kid, right? From you growing up with these phrases and these, uh, uh, you know, connected uh, tales that were worth uh, finding out, maybe just kind of in search of yourself a little bit, right? Like you, I grew up being a fan of Tolkien. Yeah. And I I was lucky enough, I grew up on, on a small farm. And so I would, as a kid, I would play in the woods and the pasture. And I'd look for fairy rings of mushrooms. And I'd try to find this, the cave and the passageways. And what I found when I started looking into the ballads, well, I also, as you probably know, I, I, you can probably guess, I love music. And I became a fan of Fairport Convention and oh. Steel Ice Band. Okay. And so when I was getting into the research and looking at the ballads and the folklore, I was just amazed at the the people of the Scottish borders two and a half, three centuries ago. The elves and the fairies and the, the special things like that mm -hmm. were real to them. It yeah. was as real as just saying, well, the, here comes the postman to deliver the, the mail. Right. It's like well, the good neighbors and the brownies, and they were just part of their daily lives. That's the part that that a reader gets pulled into that as you do such a wonderful job at the front end given the the need for the reasons for that setting uh, and just the flux within these borderlands you know the the book starts off with uh you know about the history of that space and the we, i think you call the vagaries of life all the things that were, that happened over these people that was beyond their control that sets it makes it necessary to have some other resource some other uh, human or not human a uh, resource right. which to tap into my ancestors yeah were just the they were caught in the middle yeah between england and the ruling families of Scotland, which all lived in the cities or into the north. Yeah. And so they just tried to live their lives. And I think we're, we see that in modern times now with all the stuff happening around the world. Sure. Of just the regular folks who are just, the, the powers that be are just walking over them. And they're just caught in the middle. What's so nice about it as a thesis is that you cover the wars of that area, the the you know the politics of that time, the religion of that time, and how all those things, each one, each one of those factors may render uh, these people more and more and more helpless. And yet they still lived, they still raised their families, they still planted their crops and milked their cows. Yeah, did their they lived their lives. Exactly. So, so life goes on. Uh, life goes on. The powers that be again started to. They took away the promise of purgatory. Yes. The they got into the spiritual and they they literally said you can't have your good neighbors anymore. You can't have the redemption, the, the promise of recovering from the sins of your life, if possible. Mm -hmm. And so they took that away from them. And then at the very end, when the 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 ballads and the folklore tales changed to reflect that, and people started seeing the elves and the fairies leaving, they saw, like Tolkien wrote about, they were going into the west. They just marched into the hill. They marched off to the west. They left and never came back. Yeah, it's it's almost like uh, uh, the this special time and and these uh, special people had access had a unique access to this underworld and and so it became commonplace for them but as times change and you know, the influx of modern times it takes away kind of our ability to see or our ability to sense uh that there's something other than ourselves yeah and i like the fact that i started discovering that there were well we would call them scientists now but they were uh trying to do research. They were trying to find out what was going on. And one of them was a guy named Robert Kirk. He was a pastor in Aberfoyle, Scotland. And he was an educated person. And he was told, go see what's happening 
with this talk of elves and fairies and mm -hmm. what have you. Okay. And he investigated and he came back and he wrote his, well, he didn't finish writing his notes before he disappeared. But what he put together later became collected as the secret commonwealth of elves and fairies and fawns and such. He, in that work, he wrote that he talked to the elves and the fairies and he interviewed them. And he started to, well, as the story goes, he went up Dune Hill and, and outside of Aberfoyle and just never came back. Yeah. And the image, the picture on the front cover of the book, of my book, right. is Dune Hill outside of Aberfoyle. When my when Barb and I visited, we had to we had to make sure we went and checked it out. Yeah, uh, the uh, Bermuda tri Triangle, <laughs> right. Scotland. You know, people would go and get lost, or just the notion that people would get lost is used to, for folks who are just kind of conceiving in the book. In the front part of it has this historical, religious, political um, through lines that sort of shows how you know, people wrote about it at the time and just shows that it was very commonplace that, that this was a common belief not it wasn't treated as a myth it was just it was a reality right. and then as the book moves forward you go through the the different kinds of elves from the you know the good neighbors and yeah trooping fairies and then into the brownies and then you use these tales as illustrations all the way through the book so you start to learn about the different kinds of elves, it ends up being a kind of a darker and darker story as you get deeper into it. And that was intentional. When I found out, or when I ran into this fact that purgatory was, in my opinion, become synonymous with the middle way, the path to Elfland. In, in the ballad Thomas the Rhymer, uh, the queen of fairy is taking Thomas off to Elfland for seven years to be her lover. And she stops and says, there's the road that goes to heaven. And there's the road that goes to hell. And the middle way is the road that goes to Elfland. Yeah. And when I read that, well, that's purgatory. Yeah. And so then I started finding more stories about people who've, humans who visited the elf lands and saw their neighbors who had died working in the fields in Elfland. Yeah. And I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> Tolkien didn't talk about that. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, raised a Catholic. That the first thing that jumped out to me in the book, or that swept me into the book, was the whole notion about purgatory. And how it was, you know, being misused by the church, you know, so you could try to buy more... Uh, more ways into, into heaven for your loved ones. But it's elimination changes the rules entirely in this. You were slightly imperfect and you're gone down <laughs> straight to hell. Uh, there is no middle ground. Wow. As a little kid, I really thought purgatory was great. There's a path for me. There's, it's the idea that there is no one so evil that cannot be redeemed if they choose to be redeemed. Yeah. And there's no, and the door is just never shut completely.
Whitney. Ready to dance?
That was not from the new album. That's from another album. They're all good. Shut up. She woke up, woke up from where she was, lying still. Said, I gotta do something by where we're going. Step on a steam train, step out of the driving rain, maybe. Run from the dark. Just a little bit. 